Excellent. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to listen to my talk, and thanks for the We Love Speed team for all my information. Um, as was just said, um, I'm Matt Hobbs, and um, I'm head of front end at Government Digital Service, or GDS. Um, I've worked at GDS for um, just over two years. Before then, I primarily worked in digital media agencies, both in the UK and Australia. I'm going to give you my opinion on why web performance matters. Um, this talk is primarily looking at it from the perspective of government services, but hopefully there'll be some key takeaways you can use in your own sectors too. So there may be a few people here who haven't heard of GDS before, so I'll give you a brief rundown of who we are and what we do. We've built and maintain a number of government services, for example, Gov.uk Pay is a secure payment service that's easily in integrated into other government services. And Gov.uk Design System is a set of components, styles and patterns to help service teams across government build services that are consistent with Gov.uk. But what we're primarily known for is building and maintaining Gov.uk. Gov.uk is a, the we a website for the UK government. It's the best place to find policy, announcements, information about government, and guidance for citizens. Since 2012, it's replaced 1,884 government websites with just a single one to become the home for all central government's online content and services. As of the last count, gov.uk has 491,000 content pages from 25 ministerial and hundreds ministerial departments and hundreds of government organisations. It's big and sprawling enough that no one actually seems to know how many services there are, but there's at least 750. And between them, they handle billions of transactions every year. Gov.uk can help you renew or replace your passport, or offer guidance on how to report buried treasure, or it can help you get a micro pig license to allow you to walk your pet pig. I'm not making this up, this page actually exists. So Gov.uk hides the intricacies of government behind a single website and allows users to find trusted information and signposts to services. In regards to web performance, Gov.uk is the linchpin that ties everything together digitally for central government. If performance is poor, users are going to have a bad time. So when it comes to web performance, the experience of our users is of the utmost importance. So who are our users? We have between 50 and 55 million user visits per month to gov.uk. Um, that's a Google Analytics uh, definition of a user. It doesn't equate to uh, that many people in practice. You could have a, a same user coming um, to, from a different browser or a different device. A high percentage of users come from the United Kingdom, approximately 84%. The next largest percentage is from the United States um, at approximately 3%. Uh, the other 13% is made up of countries like India, Germany, France, and Australia. Many expats use gov.uk Verify for their pension needs. Uh, many foreign nationals use the visa service to apply and renew their visas. The most popular browser visiting the site is Chrome, with approximately 43%. Um, the Safari, Safari is second at 36%, and Internet Explorer is third with 7%. Now, these stats all include mobile, tablet, and desktop devices. For Safari, 91% of users are on the iOS version. Mobile is now the most popular device users use to browse gov.uk, with approximately 50% of users. This is a recent development. Since February 2019, mobile has consistently had more users than desktop. Tablet has been holding steady for uh, around 8% for a number of years now. I'd love to give you some solid information around demographics like age or gender, but we actually don't track that in our Google Analytics, so we don't have that information. But what I guess, what I guess is that it's all genders um, from the age of 15 years and nine months upwards, as that's when you can first apply for a provisional driving license in the United Kingdom. This equates to 50, approximately 53 million people, or 81.1% of the population, according for the, to the Office for National Statistics. 
Now we know a little bit about gov.uk users. How does web performance affect them on a daily basis? I have three user stories I can share with you. These are all true um, and have been reported to us through various channels. Their names have been changed to protect their privacy. The first is Colin, a farmer from Welshpool in Mid Wales. He lives in a remote area of the country. He has a broadband internet connection, but it's shared between his neighbours. Because of this, he's found that the perfect time for him to complete his government service admin tasks is at four o'clock in the morning, when no one else in the area is using the internet. His connection is so slow later in the day, the service is so unpleasant to use, he simply won't use it. The second is David and Sarah, a couple who live on the outskirts of Abergavenny in South Wales. When filling out their DBS check profile, they experienced errors that they assumed they were responsible for. On investigation, it was the speed and stability of their broadband internet connection that was causing the issues. It was disconnecting and the service simply timing out while they were trying to complete the task. And lastly, a little closer to home for me at least, my mother-in-law, Jean, who lives close to Woodstock in Oxfordshire. She has a broadband connection, but it's slow and unstable. She has a smartphone, but she can only get reception in one part of her house if you stand upstairs in a particular bedroom next to the window. After much frustration trying to tax her vehicle, she ended up completing it at my house some 35 minutes away in Bicester. <coughs> In 2017, the Tech Partnership updated what is called the Digital Exclusion Heat Map. This map shows the likelihood of digital exclu exclusion across the UK at a local authority level. The deep purple colour is exclusion is likely. Clear colour, exclusion unlikely. The map uses eight different social metrics to calculate the overall likelihood of exclusion. This includes open source data related to age, education, broadband infrastructure and mobile infrastructure. So we have three users who are experiencing poor web performance. So let's see where on the map they appear. As you can see, two of the stories, Colin and David and Sarah from Wales, are in the deep purple section of the map. These are areas that are very likely to have digital exclusion. The third marker, based in Oxfordshire, sits somewhere between likely and unlikely to have digital exclusion. Now these are just three user stories from these digital exclusion areas. Look how much purple the, uh, you can see on the map and how, how much population that actually covers. These example stories aren't going to be a rare occurrence. Many people will be having these performance issues across the whole of the United Kingdom. So when optimizing web performance, it's important to consider what devices users are using to access government services. So let's have a look at that. On gov.uk, we have approximately 10,000 mobile devices listed, listed accessing the website. We have six, approximately 16,000 mobile device and operating system combinations. By far the most popular mobile device is the iPhone. It's used by 51% of mobile users. This is closely followed by, well not closely followed, this is followed by the iPad with 10% usage and a number of Android devices uh, like the Samsung S8. S9 and S7. But many of these devices um, are classed as modern with uh, high-end high specifications. When it comes to web performance, I'm more interested in the other end of the spectrum. As it's important to remember that not all users can afford the latest top-of-the-range mobile phone or laptop. Many users may be using devices that are a number of years old, possibly passed down from family members or purchased second-hand. So what devices are users using that would be classed as legacy? The first problem, what's the definition of a legacy device? Could you examine the CPU and RAM available in each device and classify it from that? Possibly, but with thousands of device combinations, that's going to take a long time. So eventually I settled on a definition that I thought worked quite well. A device is defined as legacy by me if either of these statements is true. The device is no longer supported by the manufacturer, essentially they have declared it legacy, or the device's default browser doesn't auto-update. A browser that auto-updates is known as an evergreen browser, 
Um, the term exists because there are many browsers that are tied to specif specific operating system versions and therefore can be updated. Exporting the data from Google Analytics gave me a long spreadsheet that looked like this. A graph of this sheet gives you an idea of the long tail involved in this data. The long flat line you see um, isn't an error in the graph. They are all devices with a low number of users, just under 4,000 devices and operating system combinations. The data set would have been much larger, but Google Analytics only exports data with 100 users or more. So I began the tedious work of looking at each of the devices and looking to see what operating system they ship with, what, OS, what the OS update path is, where they were last, when they were last updated, um, and what's the default browser. For each device, I could then answer a simple question. Is the device legacy? Yes or no? So the results I found, I find quite interesting. In the 30 days of data I examined, we had 56 million users visiting gov.uk. Around 59% were on mobile devices, or approximately 33 million users. From the data I've sorted, approximately 3.3 million user visits were on legacy devices. This works out to be approximately 6% of all user visits, or 10% of mobile visits. So here's a list of the top 10 legacy devices users use on gov.uk. First, there's the Apple I iPad um, on 9 iOS 9.3.5. They're browser locked to Safari 9. Um, the second is the Apple iPhone. That's, browser lo that's locked to 10.3.3, and it's browser locked to Safari 10. And the Galaxy X S6 is locked to Android 7, and Samsung dropped all updates in April 2018. So let's examine the actual performance of those legacy devices against high-end versions available today using Geekbench 4. The iPad Pro, iPad Pro 11 inch is 15 times more powerful than our top legacy iPad 2 on a single core, and 32 times more powerful when using multiple cores. The iPhone 8 is 12 times more powerful on a single core, and 17 times more powerful when using multiple cores than our top legacy iPhone, the iPhone 5C. Both these devices are used by approximately 0.5% of our users, and that works out to be around a quarter of a million user visits. That's a lot of traffic. Being a government service, we can't ignore those users. But you don't only get poor performance on old devices. Devices being sold brand new today, frequently struggle with today's web. These are usually low-cost, underpowered Android devices. Tim Cadlick, a web performance consultant in the US, wrote a blog post on the ethics of web performance, where he stated, there is a growing gap between a high -end what a high-end device can handle um, and what a mid to low-end device can handle. He tested two devices, the Google Pixel 2, released in 2017, a high-end Android device, and the Alcatel One X, released in 2018, a budget Android device. The test page on the Pixel 2 loaded in 19 seconds. On the Alcatel One X, it took 65 seconds to load. That's a 242% slower for the exact same page. A high-end Pixel, Pixel 2 is five times more powerful than the Alcatel One X. The t key takeaway here is you should test on legacy and low-spec devices. By testing on low-spec devices, you know that your users actually use. You'll be able to identify bottlenecks and prioritize them to be fixed. By fixing bottlenecks on low-spec devices, you're also improving web performance on all devices. As the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. All users will benefit from improved performance. A big part of improving web performance is in understanding what connections your users use. So let's examine the information we have about our users in the UK, as connection speeds vary massively. In 2019, the average broadband speed in the UK was approximately 22 megabits. But even in London, a city with global connections and infrastructure, there have been reports of users only getting speeds of 0.26 megabits. So if you have a poor broadband connection, can you rely on mobile data? Unfortunately not. 
An Ofcom report from 2019 found that 8% of indoor spaces in the UK have no mobile data coverage. The first 5G service was released in the UK in May of this year. The comments from the BBC News article at the time made for interesting reading. Getting a phone signal in parts of Essex can be a problem. Some parts of Scotland are still waiting for broadband. And in Suffolk, praying to the network guard may actually help. And even if you could rely on mobile data, would you want to? Mobile data is expensive and often very limited. The average monthly plan in the UK costs 21 euros for just under two gigabytes of data. Considering the medium desktop page weight on the web today is 1.9 megabits, what megabytes and almost 1.8 megabytes on mobile, that 1.9 gigabytes isn't going to stretch far over a month. If we only focus on the past 12 months, the median desktop page weight has increased by 28%. The median mobile page weight by almost 40%. These are huge percentages for a single year. Looking at the data from gov.uk, the majority of our users are on a connection speed that is 4G or greater. 3G seems to be gradually increasing, which is unusual. I'm still trying to work out why that is, so if anyone's got any theories, please let me know. I'd love to know. Um, I've omitted 2G from the graph since it's 0% for all months. To be clear, there are 2G users, but due to the way this data is collected and categorized, they are all being bumped up into the 3G bracket. All things considered, due to the fairly high percentage and increasing percentage of 3G, uh, 3G connection speed, this is one we are actively testing on. So one task to add to your web performance checklist. Make sure you test a website's performance on slow connections. You can do this via the browser web tools, or if you know somewhere that has a slow connection, try it in person on a real device. Many of your users don't have the option of a faster connection. If your website size is gradually increasing over time, these users will struggle. So optimize for the connections that they have. So one of the major impacts of poor performance on a user is stress. I'm sure we've all been in this situation. You're purchasing something on an e-commerce website. You've entered your card details, you've submitted the form, and you're waiting for confirmation. It's taken a while, so long in fact, it eventually times out. Poor web performance has turned this routine purchase into a stressful experience. So you're asking the question, did the order go through? Did I actually pay for it? Should I reload the page? Do I need to check my bank account to see if it's gone through? Now we don't have much in terms of e-commerce in government, but what we do have is a whole selection of forms that can have real world implications to users if incorrectly completed or not completed at all. Forms like applying for a passport, registering a death, or applying for a blue badge, which is essentially a, a disabled parking permit. Here's an example tweet from a user. The user was implying, applying for a disabled parking permit. The save progress, there was no save progress function um, on the form, the page timed out, three hours wasted. Now, although this isn't directly linked to web performance, it gives you an idea of how much work users may need to do to complete some government forms. Research from Glasgow Caledonian University found that participants had to concentrate 50% more when trying to complete a simple task on a badly performing website. So imagine what happens with a complex task. The last thing a user needs when completing an already stressful form is poor web performance. Poor performance stresses users out. A stressed user will get annoyed and may give up on the task completely, leading to high dropout rates. Unsure if your website is stressful? Do some user testing with users under real conditions. So what happens if a, a, a government service performs badly? As the user stories and connection information showed, poor web performance negatively, negatively affects users, ultimately leading to exclusion. In government, if a user can't get to the information and guidance they need, where can they go? 
There are no competitors a user can use to get this information. If the, inf the website is performing poorly, a user will need to find different government channels, like email or phone inquiries. These channels are expensive to run and ultimately cost the taxpayer more money. There's also the risk that some users will be driven to sites that charge for information that services in government provide for free. These businesses are, are essentially copying government guidance, they're filling in a form, and they're adding a huge markup on top. But what about policy? Is there a government policy to enforce web performance? I'm afraid not. For accessibility, we have an EU directive to follow. We have a legal obligation to do so. But although we don't have a legal obligation around web performance, I believe we do have a moral obligation to make sure our websites perform well for all users. The reason being, well, it's simply the right thing to do. No user should be excluded from a government service. Anyone who needs to be able to access it should be able to. So what are we doing at GDS to optimize front-end web performance? Here are just a few things we are, have implemented or are currently investigating. HTTP2 is a new um, revision of the HTTP protocol. It was standardized in 2015 and is supported by 95% of browsers used by users today. One of our main goals of H one of the main goals of H2 is to improve page loading um, speed by fixing known performance issues in HTTP 1.1. In October 2018, we trialed the use of H2 on gov.uk for four weeks to test to see if it improved performance for our users. After four weeks, it was decided to disable it. Um, as according to our synthetic testing, it was actually decreasing performance for many users. The reason for this decrease is because we have a separate assets domain that acts as a bottleneck under HTTP2. This is called domain sharding and is a performance optimization used in HTTP 1.1 but can cause problems in HTTP2. At the moment, we are working to remove the separate domain. Once completed, we'll trial HTTP2 again and reevaluate. A great way to improve performance is to reduce the amount of data a user needs to download. One way to do this could be reduce the number of assets, or you could look at leveraging new browser features. WAF2 is a, a font type now supported by all modern browsers. WAF uh, web fonts are a, pro, a prime candidate for optimization. We have a new optimized WAF2 version of the gov.uk font, which is reducing data required by 47% for both font, font weights we use. This was added to the latest version of the gov.uk design system and is gradually being rolled out across all of our services. Brotly is a new compression algorithm supported by modern browsers. It promises up to 25% better compression than gzip. We're investigating the use of Brotly compression for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. From our initial tests, it has shown a 20% improvement in data transferred over the network compared to our current gzip implementation. As many of you may know, Chrome very recently enabled native image lazy loading. So we are trialing that on a very image heavy page on gov.uk, the past prime minister's page. We've seen some great improvements on this page using the technique, including a 22% reduction in first content for paint and a 25% reduction in bytes transferred. So it's something that we are rolling out across all of our applications uh, in the future. We offer guidance in the service manual that other service teams across government can follow when building their services. We're raising awareness of web performance and making sure that it, your teams know that it's important for government services. This will enable teams to prioritize and focus on performance in the alpha service phases before it becomes an issue for our users. Although I've approached this talk from the point of view of a government service, there's no reason this can't be applied to any website in any sector. After all, this is a problem that is true for every website in every sector. With more rich media content being added to websites, they're increasing year on year. So how can you improve web performance and help your business? Start by focusing on your users. Who are they? What are their stories? 
What devices and connections are they using? Why are you users on your website? What's your core service? Have you tested on real devices and connections that they use? Have you tested with users to minimize their stress? Above all else, strive to be inclusive, not exclusive. Front-end web performance matters. At its heart, it's about showing empathy and understanding that every user has different needs. Every user doesn't have the latest laptop or uh, handset. What about older devices? Every user doesn't have a 100 me megabit connection in a major city. What about users in rural areas or an unstable network? Every user isn't just browsing for their leisure. What about users trying to complete an important and stressful task? We don't know who our users are or what their exact situation is, so we can't just assume we do. Now I'm going to borrow a quote from a talk I saw in November 2017 from front-end developer Charlie Owen. She said, ultimately, the job of a front-end developer is to make people's lives better, or at least not make it worse. And by improving web performance, you're only going to be making people's lives better. So I've gathered a number of resources, because um, this is a very UK-heavy um, post, as you'd expect. But there's a few resources here around um, French uh, telecommunications and uh, the internet. And I've also got a French version um, of this talk, all translated, if you prefer, as well. And I'm, I'll share this after the, uh, after the talk. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Matt, for your talk. It was really interesting to, to like deep dive into the data and see how uh, the GDS and uh, developers at GDS can make the people's lives better. Uh, I think we have some time for uh, one or two questions. Uh, Boris here uh, is going to hand you the microphone. Um, anybody has any question? Um, so if you if we look at the, I don't know the exact figure. I could certainly find out. But for example, the home page itself is probably around um, six or seven hundred k, um, and that's because we're using an older version of um, the the WAF2 font, an unoptimized version. So when we bring that in, um, that will be uh, that should bring it down quite a significant amount. Um, and we have um, we have very little. Um, in terms of images or um, JavaScript either, so it's that still actually sounds quite big, um, I must admit. But um, yeah, I'll, I could certainly find that out if that's something that you'd uh, be interested in. Yeah, so. We are trialing um, ho have our own um, internal um, version of, of SiteSpeed um, to monitoring, monitoring key um, areas of gov.uk. Um, we also use a tool called SpeedCurve as well that we um, monitor our services with and look for performance issues. We don't, uh, we don't you do any sort of RUM testing. Um, I would love to do RUM testing, but um, it's quite expensive, and getting sign-off for that is, is quite difficult. But ultimately, my goal would be to run test everything so we could have a, a broader view of um, how our users are doing in terms of performance. Hi, Matt. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, you showed a map of the UK with the connection speeds. Is that a map you made yourself, or did you get it from somewhere? I think you mentioned some open source data. Oh, uh, the, uh, the tech, par tech partnership. That, so that's a, um, that's a specific group that was set up, a research group, and they created the map. So um, there are, I can um, certainly link to that in the slides as well. I'll add that as well, because um, I only listed um, three or four metrics, but they, they look into probably 10 or 12 different metrics um, across a wide range. Um, and they, there was a 2015 version, and that's a 2017 version. I'm hoping there'll be an updated version, because it would be nice to see the change over time. Um, but that, yeah, that was, a, uh, that was a separate group that did that. Thanks. Hold on. Merci à tous.
Merci à Matt, vous pouvez l'applaudir.